Hello and welcome to Artwork, a conversation with creative people about the joys, the challenges and the mundane moments of living an artistic life. We're your hosts, I'm Poppy Rose. And I'm Bree Robertson. And our artist today is Reverend Dr. David William Parry. David is a published author, poet, celebrant, dramaturg, TEDx speaker, fellow of the Royal Society of Arts, active libertarian, member of the World Nation Writers' Union, Honorary Doctor of Divinity and Queer Pastor of Valentine's Hall, a metropolitan community church oasis founded in South London. He is also the co-founder and curator of Extremists Club, which later became Free Speech Club, a project he talks about in the episode that brought people from all walks of life together in discussion. David is a well of inspiration and experience and we absolutely loved speaking with him. It was wonderful to hear someone speak with such passion and affirmation about how vital the arts are and how each one of us has something valuable to contribute. In this episode, we talk about how we've never needed the arts more than right now and the power the arts have to bring people from different lines of thought together. And we were even gifted an impromptu recitation of David's first poem, Miranda. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the Artwork Podcast today, David. We're so thankful and happy that you've given us some of your time to share a bit of your journey today. We are really excited to hear about your journey as an artist in all the different hats that you have worn throughout your life. Um, But before we ask any specific questions, we'd love to hear from you. How would you best describe yourself and what you do? Um. Oh, gosh, what a good question. I mean, I've been looking forward to this show a great deal, let me say that. Um, I I tend to see myself as doing one thing in various ways. Um, I'm sort of a a short, fat uh, minister of the gospel, minister of religion, um, with an intense love of global text, global poetry. Um, It's true, I keep going on and on and on about Shakespeare, and there are reasons for that. But uh, no, I mean, my whole view is global. I mean, there are great literary treasures absolutely everywhere. Mm. Um, And also sometimes that overspills onto the British stage. Um, So I've had the chance to direct and produce sometimes both. Oh, my God, you know, when the budget is so small and everybody's (laughs) got to do everything, you know, (laughs) sometimes I've had to do both. Um, you know, nine theatrical productions. We we might be exploring a further one, possibly the year after next. I don't know yet. But no, I mean, I, I'm a minister. I'm a minister in love with creativity and in love with uh, the artistic community per se. I think we're an undervalued treasure in, in the various mm-hmm. communities we're in. You know, and people lose us and don't listen to us at their peril. Mm-hmm. Something goes missing. Something goes it becomes shallow if they forget the artistic community. So I'm on my soapbox today and I'm fighting fit to remind everybody, be nice to creatives because <laughs> actually we all benefit if you are. Oh, definitely. Oh, 100%. Oh, that was amazing. I'm really interested in in something that you just said. I, I wondered if you could give us a little bit more details about why you think the artistic community is so valuable to society what do you think we would miss if if artists just disappeared tomorrow (laughs) (laughs) well let me go interesting question again i mean what would we miss everything you know i remember reading uh, the bell jar by sylvia plath Mm -hmm. many years ago and of course she i love her poetry i mean her poetry is just mind-blowing i actually don't like her prose as much as she would have liked, because she always said, of course, that in an age such as ours, writers basically focus on prose more than lyricism. I actually think she's wrong about that. And, you know, I I think her prose is incredibly analytic, but at the same time, it's the poetry that comes alive. I mean, you know, the sort of of Tibetan Buddhist, everything's dying and why don't we know it? And, you know, treasure the moment and the, the instantaneous... A flaring of beauty is something that can never be replaced. I remember in the in the bell jar itself, um, Esther Greenwood, I think that's the protagonist, is having a, a, 
a contretemps, let's say, with one of her male protagonists may or may not be a boyfriend. I, I think she disguises relationships very cleverly in that book, mm. um, who is a physician. And he's going on and on about the lasting effects of medical science, to which uh, Greenwood turns around and says, a good poem outlasts any medical book, I'm paraphrasing, any medical work and anything you can come up with. Um, I think that's important to remember. You know, we're not just machines. Uh, we, we are imagination. We are fantasy. I think there's a very great divide between those two things, by the way. But both are necessary. You know, we're creatures that like to to play and enact and uh, fantasize. And, you know, uh, I, the life of an actor is, is, is probably the best life, even better than a minister, if I'm allowed a moment of treachery. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in, in the in the morning you can be a cavalier. In the afternoon you can be a philosopher. In the evening you can be a space alien. You know, but it's, oh no, no, there's magic in those worlds. And I, I suppose I've always had the belief that the human spirit, you know, Adam, um, has two eyes. I'm going to get lyrical and mystical on everybody. You know, one of which is reason, um, and we need it. You know, we need to eat. We need to drink. We need accommodation. We need to be able to rationally look after those nearest and dearest to us but the other eye is really imagination mm -hmm. um you know obviously the two sides of the brain and so on uh, and we need both functioning if we're to be fully human not just one i mean there was an experiment in germany about 70 years ago which wanted to stifle one of those spheres and look what happened then you lose things like empathy mm -hmm. you lose things like sympathy you lose that vital, humane connectivity that makes us fully human. God, does that answer you? That's me rambling, isn't it? That was such an amazing answer. I, I feel really affirmed already by what you've said of just, I, I think so much that's come out of the conversations we've had so far on artwork, there's been a lot of doubt from the artists that, what they're doing is worthwhile and a lot of pressure on artists nowadays to almost turn their art into something um, like a machine to, to pump it out and keep up with the pace of everything that's going on in the world. But it's so nice to just hear someone say like, we need that imagination. We need that play just for the sake of it as humans. Um and I, yeah, it's just so affirming to hear you say that. Well, you know, something worries me when that's not in play. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. I'm not anti anybody, but if you look at Soviet Russia and you look at communist China, they actually tried to systematize the arts, of course, and make them like like, like conveyor belts in a in a factory. And what mm -hmm. was the result both times? Absolute failure. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you you know end up with Soviet realism, which has one or two interesting things and then the whole thing collapses and the artistic community secretly rebels and holds you know fight clubs um no we we we, we we're free and spontaneous human beings as well we we lose those things you know uh, it, they always resurface anyway gosh you reminded me of a story um it was beethoven a very misunderstood man nowadays a rebel every single bone in that body of his was rebellious he was walking um, with, I can't remember a friend, a very note, uh, noteworthy friend in the arts too, and a group of young aristocrats were coming in the opposite direction. The custom in those days would have been for everybody else to bow as they went past. People forget that, how rigid our societies actually were in the past, and we might be, God, what a terrible thought, aiming back to that. Hey, we need art even more then. Um, so Shakespeare, who was never one to be browbeaten by anybody, ends up pushing his way through the young aristocrats and shocking them and his companion. And his companion said, what on earth are you doing? To which uh, he replied, um, we are the princes of the spirit, not them. And we make worlds, we make kingdoms, and they should be aware of that when we are passing. Mm. Uh, paraphrase terribly, but again, from the horse's mouth, Beethoven, that wonderful lyrical music that never, ever stops. Um, no, no, we need to remember how vital we are, not only to the human condition, but to the healthy functioning of our societies generally. And again, I think that's a global thing. I, mm -hmm. I've done a lot of work at the risk of preempting the questions. I mean, Azerbaijan, I love Azerbaijan to bits. It's an incredible country, an incredibly ancient, rich, exotic culture. 
and I've done a, an absolute ton of work in Central Asia, which is, I suppose, my home away from home. Right. You know, I've walked along the very streets where, Elad where Aladdin, as a boy, as a schoolboy, got into a fist fight for stealing things. Oh, I have wow. been to the very mosque where the genie was put in the lamp by angry mullahs. Um, you know, how can we lose those things? Certainly the Soviet Union at its best was trying to rob uh, the Central Asians of those cultural treasures. So what happened? It all went underground and eventually there was a big battle. You know, people coming out and having huge debates and saying this simply isn't right. This is us. This is our soul. This is our history. You can't take that from us. And eventually the Soviets, who were not monsters, eventually seeing sense and saying, yeah, we agree. We agree with that. And, um, you know, at the risk of, again, sort of dragging endless texts into things, there, there's a text in Central Asia called Manas. Okay. Uh, I can't even remember how long it, long it is now. A Russian philologist, their hair falls out the minute they start thinking about these things. It, I think it's up to 30 volumes at the minute. It's the longest poetic epic in the world. It even beats uh, uh, the Mahabharata from India. It's it's longer than everything. And, you know, it, it, what is it? The story of a people, the story of a spirituality, the the epic journey of a type of creativity which we need to know about and remember that they, under all sorts of conditions, when you've got the warriors of Genghis Khan pulling your city down around you, they're mm. still hiding poetry and they're still saying a better day will be ahead of us. That's the power of art, and that's what artists in our time must remember. Mm. Yeah, I yeah, absolutely wow. adore the passion that you speak about all of this with. Like, it is so yeah. like it, exciting and inspiring to to really hear and feel. Um, yeah, the passion that you have for for the arts, like it's really amazing, oh, and you're constantly. Um, you know drawn back to to poetry and you know that's you know you write poetry it's it's who you are um, or a huge part of who you are um, but yeah I'd love if you could tell us like how did your your journey with poetry begin like do you remember was there like a first poem um, that you read or heard or experienced um, that kind of made you drawn to this to this art form um yeah, just tell us how your journey with, with that uh, began and evolved. Gosh, I started writing poetry when I was seven, but I, you know, I, I don't think that's unusual. I think, uh, you know, children experiment with all sorts of arts and that needs to be encouraged further, not, not uh, defunded. Mm -hmm. um, oh, what's happening in Britain at the moment? Don't get me on that, you two. No. We'll be here all night. <laughs> Let's not. Um, you know, for God's sake, the angry minister arises. Um, but, you know, no, we, it's right and proper for children to experiment with their creativity. It's absolutely essential mm -hmm. for a healthy society down the road. And at the end of the day, they're our future. We've got to remember that. Yeah. You know, they're not just annoying encumbrances. That's the future. They're human beings in their own right, and they deserve that respect and that level of support. Um, certainly, I started reading school poetry, which were just sort of limericks at that particular time. Um, to this day, I remember um, I went to lots of private schools, posh private schools, for the simple reason um, I was in the middle of the countryside. And there wasn't always an alternative. So I, got, I was very lucky. I was very lucky. And we had a, I remember primary school to this day. We had a madhead mistress called Mrs. Smith, um, who all the teachers hated her because she loved the, the kids so much. She loved the children so much. And every every Wednesday was always a danger zone with the teachers looking nervous. I remember one particular Wednesday where her, I mean, in those days, my heavens, how much money did she have? The four by four rolled up the drive. All the teachers went as white as a sheet. She suddenly threw a group of uh, kids skis on the floor and said, all the, ca all the classes are cancelled. Am I going to learn skiing? So we <laughs> all put on our kids skis. And we had learn how to walk up the piece, down the piece, sideways. And it was just wonderful. Oh, and I think she was one of the people that I, I hallow, I treasure to this day as someone who defended creativity in the arts. And she gave me a w really weird look one afternoon and saying, right, you've got to read this. You're not going home yet. And I thought, you know, what a person woman talking about. And I noticed um, when I was sat down with her, she made a cup of coffee, cup of tea. 
it was a book on global art um and i was mesmerized by every single page i'd never seen anything like it there were um goddesses in india who had the head of flowers i'd never seen anything like that um there were you know, energized warriors from China who were casting magical spells to make their city better places to live in. I mean, this was magical. Um, I don't think that said I actually wrote anything serious until I first moved to London. You know, I think I wrote a lot of poetry, but nowadays I tend to see those as um, a collection of words on a page as opposed to, as opposed to actual poetry. Poetry for me nowadays, there must be a metaphysical punchline. There must be a reason for having written it. That's, I'm not saying that to other people. I'm saying that to me. Um, mm-hmm. And so the first one I wrote was called Miranda because in my uh, as a teenager, I spent two years not going out. I mean, that sounds terribly freakish nowadays. But I discovered early, early teens, mid-teens, Russian novels – you know, what do Russian novels give you? They give you the world. It's not just a story. It's not just a history. It's not just philosophy. They give you everything. I remember reading Tolstoy to this day, War and Peace, and thinking, oh, my God, am I strong enough to live in a world like that? Mm. Um, you know, so I remember that. And little snippets of Central Asian material would come through. There was hardly anything translated and in the public domain in those days. But every now and again, one of the Russians would say something which I'd make a sort of mental note of and thinking, oh, my heavens, that's really interesting. It's, it's like nothing I've ever read before. Um, so being influenced by, I'd say, Russian literature and my passion for Shakespeare during my later teens, I discovered Shakespeare. And uh, why don't schools stop ruining great art? You know, if you don't know how to present it, don't do yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and I realised there was a school production of something or other which I detested. And somebody said to me, well, actually, there's, you know, an, a, another uh, a production of that happening over in Portsmouth. I went to school in Portsmouth. Um, and it was of, I can't remember, I don't think it was The Tempest. I think it was A, a Midsummer Night's Dream. And the way the fairies were done, I'd never seen fairies being threatening before. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, what, what the producer, what the director's trying to do is saying these are powerful elemental forces and you cross them, you know, if, if you're brave, you cross them, but maybe you shouldn't anyway, because they're so, you know, immensely strong in our lives, in our lives internally and around us. So I started falling in love with Shakespeare. Um, but my favourite play very quickly, and I, there's a whole sort of raft of things there, became The Tempest. I mean, everybody's mm. meant to love Romeo and Juliet. I thought then, and I still think now, how selfish, you know. So everyone around you can be destroyed, but you two are okay. And then you're not at the end because you dropped the ball. So that that play always annoyed me. Um, And then also, of course, if you're looking at mature love, it's Antony and Cleopatra. It's not Romeo and Juliet. Um, So I I looked at some of the history plays. Um, I remember to this day, or rather it's sort of emblazoned onto my brain, Ian McClellan uh, uh, as Richard III jumping around like a monkey. I mean, heavens above. But, you know, if you think that's the depiction, good for you. Um, But for me, it was The Tempest. And as the years unfolded, I remember learning more and more that the the play was actually a defence of free thinking. It got Mm. Shakespeare himself into a huge amount of trouble. Um, And, you know, it's a defence, some say, of his dear friend, Dr. Jonathan Dee, who was a magician, uh, uh, a Renaissance Hermeticist, British Renaissance, uh, courtier to Elizabeth I, who some say helped sink the Spanish Armada through the sorcerer's arts. Wow. Um, what he actually did, of course, um, which is absolutely mind blowing, was start the whole science of celestial mechanics. You know, what? Hang on, that's four centuries too early. Mm-hmm. And that was said in New Scientist a couple of years ago. How can an Elizabethan mind have come up with a 20th century science? Mm. Um, So there's something magical in some sense or other, maybe in every sense, in that play. And, you know, I I realise this great figure of Prospero, this larger than life wonder worker, Mm. was, you know, all the noble things in in a human being. 
I realized his daughter Miranda was all the naive, not innocent, naive things in a human being. And then we came to the character of Caliban, mm. who uh, is the ultimate misfit. And, you know, I think we've all, if you're in the arts, you've always, at some point or other in your career, you felt like a misfit. And mm. I think if you haven't felt that, then you're probably just a corporate drone making money. Mm. Uh, creative people, whether we like it or not, feel like misfits you know even if it's temporary even if it's one afternoon what am i doing here and what am i doing doing these things you know for heaven's sake maybe i should get a sensible job we've all felt that that's <laughs> definitely a well you know get a job in the bank david no mother you know so, <laughs> so we all said that that's because uh you have to pay a price for living in worlds of magic the arts and magical spheres mm. you have to pay a price the price is less security than other people. And, you you know, one has to be mature and think, okay, that's a price I'm willing to pay. Because look at what happens if that price is paid. Magic comes into the mm-hmm. world for audiences, for, for actors, for poets, for singers, for musicians. Magic is present in the world all of a sudden. Um, but I confess that said it was Caliban that sort of captivated me as a character because he couldn't seem to do anything right. Mm. Um, and eventually I got to realise that the best poetry in the play is actually in his mouth, not Prospero's. And that sort of made this other sort of raft of questions suddenly arise out of nowhere. Why on earth would Shakespeare put the best and most convincing poetry in his mouth and not, not the heroic Prospero? But that, I think, would take us a very long time to discuss. I think there are reasons he's done that. Um, so it was that character that intrigued me, and it was when I started writing, oh my God, how about that for a long answer? It was when I started writing about my view of those plays, that's when I think I started writing proper poetry, as I would understand that word. You said in that answer that um, for you now, poetry needs to have some kind of metaphysical meaning for you to feel like it is a a poem and this was also something that I wanted to ask you about is kind of what I guess it might be two questions but over all the work that you do you have so many different roles in your life um and I wondered if there is like a central force that like drives all those things and connects those different parts of you together and when you are writing, are there specific themes or social issues that you feel particularly drawn to write about and, uh, and address in your poetry? Wow. I mean, the central thing for me is always ministry. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm going to say something that I need to explain very quickly, though perhaps I shouldn't be so quick to say that, that the binding element is Christianity. Uh, mm-hmm. But maybe I don't entirely mean what other people mean by that Mm -hmm. um before I went to university I started reading Kierkegaard um Mm -hmm. uh, he he would have said he was a romantic he wouldn't have said he was a philosopher and you know this weird quirky individual who just writes the most breathtakingly deep and beautiful books at the same time I'm really sad that reading is going out of fashion among the young because it sets you free and it empowers you and it gives you access to other people's lives and other people's insights it makes me very sad that's happening and it's schools i blame for that schools are making this wonderful passionate pursuit into something tedious and boring but that's another story Mm. um you know and it was kierkegaard the works of love i remember reading that book uh, walking through a forest thinking oh my heavens everything's about love everything's about love and wisdom Um, And his masterpiece, I mean, they're all masterpieces, um, either or, which is basically, look, either Christianity is true or it's not. You know, here we are, the bottom line. And if it is true, what is it? Don't assume you know what it is. What is it? Mm. Um, So it was stuff like that that started me reading the existentialists Mm -hmm. um, who nowadays, and I think that's in uh, vital reading for everybody, um, who nowadays I think are very good at analysis. They're very good at seeing what's, what the problem is. They're absolutely crap at seeing what the solution is. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and I wouldn't put down any of my books by Simon de Beauvoir. I wouldn't put down any of my books by Sartre. I wouldn't put down any of my books by Camus. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're left with a series of questions. And it was only Gabriel Marcel, who, of course, was also a theatre guy, as well as one of the Parisian existentialists, um, who wrote a book simply called Existentialism as someone who thought faith and belief was important. Mm. Um, and that sort of blew my mind away. I suppose it still does. I'm incredibly indebted to him saying, look, just because the other guys haven't said there might be a solution, it doesn't mean there isn't one. Um, people attacked uh, Sartre um, when Gabriel Marcel started saying that. And uh, I, I love the figure of Sartre. I think he's just incredible. But there's a humorous there's a gag, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, and Sartre said very, very stiffly to everybody, Marcel is an existentialist. Marcel is an existentialist. The end. And I thought that was heroic and selfless. I mean, I also love the absurd, believe it or not. Um, Ionesco, Eugene Ionesco is one of my favourite playwrights. Impossible material to stage. Nobody gives you the budget. And even if they do, it's impossible to stage. I mean, there was one, there's one of my favourite bits. It, you know, everybody moves to France the minute they get the chance. Oh, God, if the French are listening, I want to come over there as well. Let me in. <laughs> Let me in, please. Um, uh, Inesco had suddenly become famous uh, with the bull soprano, and there was a sweet young uh, Parisian journalist saying, oh, um, Monsieur Inesco, what do you think of Sartre? What do you think of Sartre? And he says, oh, Sartre, Sartre. One minute he says he loves the Germans, but then they lose the war. Now he tells us all he's a communist. So, you know, but it's it's the life and it's the reading, it's the vitality of all of those things that make us human. Mm. Um, what binds me together, I suppose, is a religious form of existentialism um, that isn't afraid to ask questions and rather insists that people do. What's going missing and why is that important is uh, the mechanization of life as it's proceeding at the moment to the, oh, God, I'm going to get awfully political. You can can switch me off now. Um, Go for it. Well, I mean, the corporates are acting immorally globally. They're acting in a moral way globally. You know, there are are more important things than profits and shareholders' meetings. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying those things aren't important. We, We need a... We need a rich society. We need a, a materially strong society so we can look after the sick, so we can look after the elderly. So I'm not one of those people saying, you know, oh, let's have a revolution and forget all that, because even that solves nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, people get old and people get sick. They need to be looked after. Uh, what I am saying, I suppose, is there's more. And if we allow that that particular type of technological oppression, that particular type of technological overspill, you know, superimposition, to go unchallenged, or at least for people to say, you know, okay, I accept a lot of that, but there is more, we start losing our sense of meaning and value. Mm. Um, And that, of course, is when suicide rates increase, Mm. um, and people become zombies. I mean, I don't believe in the generation Z thing. No, it doesn't mean Generation Zombie. I think the young are incredibly spiritual, but they're not religious. And it's up to people like me to say, look, there's a step above spirituality, super spirituality. Why don't we explore it together? So that's where the church goes wrong. Not my church, by the way. <laughs> get, get the parties ambited. But no, I mean, why, why are the arts more essential than they've ever been before? And why are they considered more on the periphery than ever before? Mm. It's because they want, uh, you know, yes, to stage something, you do require resources. Also, as the good book says, the labourer, the worker is worthy of his hire. Yes, we need to be paid. Uh, but what we lose if those transactions are ta- taking place is not only denuding uh, us as human beings, it's actually attacking the existential base of society as well. And we become a group of, of robots, and eventually even that won't hold together and we'll just be slaves. So mm. what holds me together? Hope. Um, hope in creativity, the promise of creativity, and what it will deliver one day. This is the darkest moment before the dawn. I think we're looking at some sort of new re- renaissance just down the road of it.
Hello. Hello. It's your artwork podcast host. Briefly interrupting this episode, we hope you're enjoying this conversation and feeling really inspired by this story. We'd just like to remind you that the artwork podcast is a completely independent project and we'd really appreciate your help in spreading the word. You can do that by subscribing, leaving a comment or a review, and sharing the podcast with your friends. You can also support the podcast through our tip jar on Patreon. If you believe in this project and you feel there's value in sharing these stories, a small contribution will help us keep going. You can choose to give a monthly or a single donation, and there are some special little rewards in there for you too. And we'd like to invite you to take part in the Artwork Conversation by joining our Artwork Community Facebook group. There, you will be able to connect with the artist we featured on the podcast and share your journey with like-minded creatives. Let's get back to the conversation. David, it's just so inspiring to listen to you. I just want to, after um, after we hang up the phone, just go and, and ask and find all these books. And some of them I've read, but I want to reread them and really like, it, it's so obvious to me that you read and you really digest it and you hold mm. it within you. And that's so amazing to hear. I think nowadays I find it so easy to, you know, fill myself with information and then it just goes out the other ear again so quickly. And it's really inspiring to hear how much you've held onto the different writings that you've read and the poetry and well, let, let me jump in there i mean i we, we i'm from fairham in hampshire and that's that's where i was born in portsmouth i hail from fairham in hampshire so like nearly you know, nearly everybody else who lives in london i'm not a londoner i think i met one once you know so you know you come here to make a life um, there was something in fairham called the escape committee a group of young scallywags that couldn't take any more of rural idiocy so we formed the escape committee and came up one by one to London. Um, it was, but nearly everybody turned into a writer. That was really odd. Um, I remember incredibly boozy evenings um, with with food scattered everywhere, with me shouting and screaming about <laughs> Ibsen. None of you understand the word Ibsen saying, oh, my God, I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, or, or there was one famous, uh, we were all walking towards uh, uh, Trafalgar Square for New Year's Eve. And I got this thing about David Hockney. Um, I don't know, there's just something really annoying me about David Hockney. And I said, oh, my, his use of colour. It's just so awful. It's so pedestrian. Why doesn't he have more more, more flair when it comes to colour? I think people who don't allow those treasures into their lives have really forgotten their own depth. You know, mm. don't let the world around you tell you you're a shallow person. You're a shallow being. You're not. You're a child of the universe. You know, you've got depth and you've got passion and you've got brains. Don't let the system tell you you haven't, because that's what they want us all to believe. I'll I'll throw a scripture at you. It's in the uh, Gospel of Matthew where our good Lord says, ye shall be as gods. And when was the last time that was mentioned in a church? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, let's stop setting ourselves short and, and, you know, throw ourselves in at the deep end because we will find nothing apart from treasure. It might be difficult swimming there for a while, but we'll find nothing but treasure and true humanity in the struggle to swim. Wow. Wow. My goodness. Oh, you've talked a little bit about um, your journey with poetry, David. I wondered if there's anything you would like to share with us today that you've written. Well, I know you are, you're, you're fishing for a, rec- a recitation. A recitation. <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll share the first poem poem I ever wrote with you. Um, oh, my okay. first two collections. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like a secret treasure myself. How many people have read them? Um, one. The first one was Caliban's Redemption, and that's written for the misfits of the world. Um, and don't take it at face value. Be careful. Uh, and the other one was called the sequel. Yeah, you know, can you have sequels in poetry? I think you can. <laughs> called The Grammar of Witchcraft. I was at the London Book Fair a couple of years ago where a Christian friend of mine stared me in the face and said, oh, I can't pick that up. To me replying, you silly bugger, it's about Shakespeare. What are you talking about? Caliban's mother was a witch. Um, so, uh, But the first poem, the first poem I wrote that's recognisable as a poem because those two works are experimental, 
um, and sometimes it's a single line. What I tried to do in the redemption was capture Caliban's thinking moment by moment. And he says some terrible things, uh, th things I'd never agree with, but they have to be in the book. They have to be in the book. And he was very hurt. I mean, he's a very hurt character. By the time you get to the end of, of the grammar, he's actually become a pagan saint. Um, but I'll leave that, I'll leave that with, with, with our listeners. Um, the first poem poem I ever wrote was called Miranda, and I'll recite it now. Amazing. I love you, holy virgin, with the soul that you have moulded, lovely as a rosebud, to the silver moon unfolded. I love you, holy virgin. I love you, queen of heaven, with the body you have fashioned, twisted in your service. By sacred sighs oh, of divine passion. I love you, Queen of Heaven. I love you, aged mother, with the mind that you have hardened, deep as dark obsidian, reflecting black thoughts yet unpardoned. I love you, aged mother. I love you. I praise you, I abase myself before you, and with golden songs adore you, my holy whore of heaven. I keep saying the word passion, but it just keeps coming up, like, yeah, you're... The, the... That's the only word I can think of right now. <laughs> the passion with which you perform and with which you share, it really is infectious um, in, in the best way. I hate the word infectious as well, um, especially in these times. But it, it's... Well, we've all got to do something together when, when the angels allow, when things loosen up. We've all got to do something together. Oh, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to meeting you one day. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, things that you've maybe worked on in the past or things you currently work on. And, and from what I gather of things um, and projects that you've done, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it seems to me that you've been quite a pioneer um, of certain movements and certain um, uh, groups and ways of thinking. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that. I guess what I'm asking is, have you been using your creativity to fight for certain social issues within society? Is that something that you have done? Have I understood that right? Oh, I mean, that's that's a bullseye, yeah. Certainly in terms of my recent book, I mean, don't forget Caliban wrote the two poetry collections, at least those two. <coughs> my recent book is uh, Mount Athos Inside Me, which is a series of essays about English literature, Mm. And more English literature because I'm I'm British, um, so the the poetry inspired by Mount Athos, the plays, uh, the novels, even the travel writing. I wanted to look at what had come from that mystical peninsula. I mean, it's a Greek peninsula technically, where all the Orthodox monks are constantly in meditation, trying to reach enlightenment. So I I thought it was strange. I was at a couple of conferences. Um, the World Public Forum dialogue between civilizations a couple of years ago. And it was actually, I mean, I just gave a couple of lectures and it was suggested that I put all that together in, in terms of a book. Mm. And, you know, it was this just an amazing, you know, an unsuspected influence on, on literature. And of course, I, I love global attitudes to literature, not just British literature. And I thought that's the perfect example. Um, I'm saying that because, curiously, my, my next book is a series of, of aphorisms loosely linked with David Warhol and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. I think that story is deeply misunderstood and we need to take the bull by the horns in the LGBT community. What is it actually saying and what is it not saying? Um, but I don't want to give too much of that away at the minute for the simple reason it's still formulating in me. Certainly in terms of how all this spills over it you know was there an overspill yes into the arts community the the, the socio-political sometimes the overtly political um meetings and gatherings and creative get-togethers in london yeah i mean a couple of years ago somebody uh, uh called it way ahead of its time recently i can't remember in which newspaper 
we started something called Extremist Club. Um, mm. And that was, I don't know, and we had left-wingers and right-wingers there. I think you two are getting to know me by now. They've all got to be there or we've missed something. And yes. that was, I had a series of talks with a quite well-known right-winger who, uh, I, you know, he uh, said to me, look, can we have a talk? And I thought, well, how odd, you know, have you got the right person? And he said, yes, I've got the right <laughs> person. Can we go for a coffee? And so we ended up in uh, the National Portrait Gallery, ha Gallery having a coffee and saying, you know, he wanted to somehow get everybody talking. And I said, well, that's easier said than done. You know, we live in a time where people are polarising. That's never good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm not talking to you because, hang on, you haven't even asked the guy, you know, who, who he is or what she's thinking, you know. Um, so he wanted to call it, my, my, my partner in crime wanted to call it the Radicals Club. And I was thinking of that on the way home, on the, on the tube, and thought, my God, well, if it was the 1700s, that would be good, but nobody will come. So I thought, well, you know, what's a buzzword going around at the moment? So we started the Extremist Club which eventually got wow. abbreviated to Extremist Club. The idea being it was a club of extremists, not a particular type of extremist. But, you know, people, in other words, what would we say on this show? People with passion, mm -hmm. uh, people that had ideas, mm -hmm. people that had something to say. <clears throat> and we extended uh, the definition for speakers um, to include people who were extremely good at something. Um, I mean, nice. two of the best speakers we, we had. It was a three-year-long project. It lasted slightly longer. Um, we, ca we, we came under attack um, after three golden years. You know, why didn't you attack us before? Because you didn't know who we were. Um, after three golden years, and I felt, oh, this is ridiculous. So we, you know, in an age where there's so little poetry, I decided to boil the title down to the Free Speech Club. So, you know, this is what we're getting at. Mm -hmm. um, but by that time, I think, you know, most of these projects have a, what, a three, four year lifespans. We, we let that rest. I mean, certainly in terms of extremist covers, I was going to say my favourite evening was, have, was having Gillian Haslam, um, who, of course, is a multimillionaire Anglo-Indian businesswoman um, who had this absolutely deplorable life uh, uh, in India. I mean, it was uh, during the time of the partition that her father was an English British officer and her mother was Indian and they fell between all of the stalls of support you know Britain was going mm -hmm. one way India was going the other way and they ended up destitute on the street um with the entire family living under a stone staircase on the street at one point um and I you know she became a great friend of mine she wrote a book called Indian English um it was you know higher powers they surround us all with their glory she felt when she was a mid-teenager, it had to be her to save the family. She's got no explanation for that feeling, that intuition. Um, and she turned up without much formal education to an open interview for 150 girls in India. Uh, she was given a pen and a piece of paper and told to write something. And for, somehow she beat them all. And a couple of years later, she was one of the senior vice presidents of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Oh my um, so, you know, she, this incredible survivor, a woman of true grit and someone who hasn't forgotten what it means to be poor. I mean, she pays out of her own purse trips to India by people who work for her to say to the local kids, never give up. Um, she tried it herself at first. I mean, she used to stand in, stand in front of local schools and, uh, you know, she used to have the opening question. Does anybody believe they can be in this position one day and none of the kids' hands would go up? Mm. And she said, would say things, right, okay, I've got a little story to tell you. And she said uh, to me, following that ages ago, you know, it's not always even the loss of food, the lack of food. It's the lack of hope that crushes mm. people. Mm. So she's trying her best to alleviate that. And the other one was uh, Sundus Abus, um, a dear friend of mine, who represents the Turkmen uh, sometimes at the, at the UN because uh, the Turkmen ethnic group have an absolutely terrible time in certain parts of the Middle East, mm -hmm. uh, certain parts of Iraq, certain parts of Iran, I believe. Um, and so she was trying to explain what it meant to be, what it felt like to be a woman in those societies and be <clears throat> a woman of prominence defending the community 
sometimes in a you know in a local shed and sometimes in the, in the United Nations itself. So I felt that was one of our most successful evenings. Um, but you know, life is what it is, and people get jealous, and they decided to have a go at us. But who knows? That project may be returning at some point. I'm sorry, was that awfully long? I think that's really, really amazing that you brought people from all walks of life under one banner. Did you see connections happening? Did you see polarize, polarize, the polarization kind of shift a little bit? And what's more is um, in our current society where things are so polarised, do you think that the arts is an important part of bringing people together and seeing each other's perspective and walking in each other's shoes? The arts is a is a hand of the saviour. The arts is vital. The arts will bring balance and the arts will bring us incre- increasing hope and increasing possibilities of cultural salvation. The arts has never been more necessary than is the now. Never. Mm. Um, it's strange you say that. I remember after the first meeting of Extremist Club, the, the co-host, the co-founder, said to me on the stairs, we held the first very successful couple of meetings the first year in the old coffee house in Soho in London. He said to me, because we hired the room upstairs, um, he said to me on the way down the staircase, well, we're all still alive then. And I thought that was because we were so, you know, we had such different views and different backgrounds. Um, the, the most successful, uh, again, m- melding, the club treasure was actually a Marxist, a Marxist Leninist. And one of the acts hadn't turned up. You two will know exactly what I mean by this. You know, the sudden panic of thinking, oh my God, there's a, a vacant slot. Now, now what do we do? And I was there in my persona as the wig. It started with somebody saying you needed Samuel Pepys to hold hold meetings like that. So I got myself a powdered wig to be Samuel Pepys. Um, so that was my persona. And it, weirdly, the minute I put the powdered wig on, I could shout people down and say, shush, you are going to listen to them. And they do it. So I don't know what's going on there. Oh, I mean, yeah, an act hadn't turned up. And I said to the club secretary, secretary bloody do something. Well, I use the phone downstairs. And he said, what shall I do? Oh, I don't know. Sing something about communist songs. So I stormed out the room trying to find out what was going on. And he had the whole of the right-wing contingent singing old Russian Soviet songs with wow. great gusto for about 10 minutes with me going back into the room, realising I will never understand audiences as long as I live. <laughs> That is amazing. As a as an artist who at times I wonder where is my place in the world and, and is it really worthwhile writing these songs and singing it? It's really reassuring to hear you say that we need the arts more than ever because um, I feel that within me, uh, but sometimes when I when I look at how society is moving, I just feel like, oh my gosh, I just feel what I'm doing is 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 meaningless or it's not being heard or you know I'm just I'm doing this in my bedroom but you know what what's the bigger point and um look it's something the Dalai Lama said if you don't think little things count try sleeping in a tent with a mosquito you know (laughs) no matter how no matter how heard or how not heard we are and but and none of us ever know none of us ever know that you know, we're all pebbles being dropped in a mystical pond. We don't know, and that's called life. We don't know how the ripples go out and who they touch and who they meet. We'll never know that, and that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, the arts, every single one of us in the arts, not only has a duty to fight back against our detractors, because they're doing it for dishonest reasons. They're doing it for the reasons of profit and to, make, and to homogenize opinion. I think that's disgraceful. Um, as human beings, we've got to learn to live with the differences and embrace the differences and, you know, do that old fashioned thing called chin wag. You know, I disagree with you because let's talk it through. Um, mm. Sometimes we won't agree. I bet more times than not, we will agree. But nobody's trying it at the moment. No, every single artist is vital to not only the recovery of post COVID-19 realities, but also to the recovery of the West. Everybody's got a song. Everybody's got a dance. Everybody's got a juggling act, a, a stage play. Everybody's got something in, of that nature within them. And some people 
with hard work and diligence, there's nothing wrong with hard work. It doesn't mean you don't have talent. It means you're doing something with your talent. You know, and no one would say to somebody who wanted a career as a plumber, and why not? What's wrong with that? Or an electrician, you know, oh, you've got great skill, but don't learn anything. You know, what on earth? And that's the attitude in some of the art colleges nowadays. You know, just express yourself. Yeah, but I want to know how to best express myself. You know, have faith in yourselves, learn from past masters, and be better than, you know, best them in the years ahead, because I'm convinced that attitude and that's the recovery we all need for a better world. Well, you've kind of already just blasted us with some amazing inspiration. and um, I, know. I was just wisdom. thinking that. But for our last question, I, yeah. <laughs> but I wondered, I and and I, I um, yeah, I say this with like all respect, is that I'm I'm so excited to have you on the on the podcast today because you're actually the the oldest person we've spoken to, <laughs> and it's so wonderful to have someone to have your perspective of someone who's been in the arts for so long and. Um, can speak from so much experience and so much like it's obvious that you've just read and and put so much into your soul that um, you can share with us. And, you know, a lot of people we talk to are, are in their 20s or their early 30s and they're just, they're getting started. And I think a lot of um, young artists nowadays, we have the ambition and we have the desire to, to be in the arts for our lives. But I think a lot of people probably assume that at some point they have to get serious and maybe get a real job or, you know, this is this is just for now while I'm young and, and I have the freedom and the independence. But I wondered if you could give some advice um, to young artists in from your experience of um, living a life of longevity in the arts and is there anything that you've learned along the way that maybe young artists could really take with them um, when they listen to this? Gosh, never give up. Never be afraid to be determined. Be true to your vision. Um, to thine own self be true. Young, uh, young artists, maybe it will only be for a couple of years when you're free. Great. Great, don't beat yourself up if that's that's what it is. Excuse me, that's what it is. If you feel there's more to it than that, pursue it. But keep your feet on the ground. Um, remember, funding's essential and making contacts and making friends throughout the industry. And that might not seem important, but it is because they will remember you. And if they think, what a talented, nice person, they will do their best to help you. Mm. Um, never give up on the arts because if you stand by them, they will never give up on you. That's my last comment on that. Do you want us to ask you another question specifically about your book? Is there any more you, that you'd like to say about that before we say goodbye? Well, I mean, you know, I, I think books about arts and why they're important. Um, are vital at this particular time. Mm. And, and certainly, I suppose, Mount Athos Inside Me is a book about books. It's a book about music. It's a book about theatre. It's a book about poetry. My sadness, which I think I managed to hide more or less in Mount Athos Inside Me, was the section on poetry. I think poets sell themselves far too short. Mm. Um, have you two ever heard of Pam Ayres? No. That name sounds very does it, familiar. Does actually. it matter if you haven't? I mean, she, you, you, yes. she, you know, lyrics, limericks. A couple of years, oh God, a couple of years, that dates me. Years and years back, she, you know, had a yeah. saucy look on her face and used to write cheeky skits. Mm, yes. um, and of course, the artistic establishment, oh, why don't they just shut up? You know, uh, decided to attack. Why? She's good at doing that and people like it. Yeah. Uh, and then she felt no one was listening and there was this awful hiatus. Um, that said, I feel poets in particular, we, we're all poets, we're all poets, uh, are, are holding themselves back because they want to be published. You know, the worst thing you can do is try and become a formula that the industry likes mm -hmm. because they know people who can do it better than you and they will pay to find them. Mm. Um, why not attract the industry 
by being something they think, my God, I've never heard that before. That's interesting. That song is in my head. Where did it come from again? Mm-hmm. You'd have a bit more faith in your own productions, have more faith in your own creativity and do what you do. And if it's the the high rise sonnets, you know, if it's something like a, a complex divine comedy by Dante, that is wonderful. But it might be a couple of cheeky lyrics down at the pump which is also good Mm. but be yourself and that's the i that didn't come across in the poetry section as much as i'd have liked but maybe it will come across in the new book oh it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for for coming and and sharing your your passion with us today i I feel really inspired after that so yeah and um yeah just thank you it's been a joy and it's been a privilege and i can't wait to do it again Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to be a part of the Artwork Conversation, we would love to invite you to join our Artwork Community Facebook group, where you can connect with the artists we've featured on the podcast and share your journey with a like-minded community. You can find the link in the show notes, as well as all the links to today's artist. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would take the time to subscribe to and review it so that more people can find us in the future. Your comments can help us pop up on more people's suggested podcasts, helping our artists' stories reach a wider audience. Podcasts are best spread by word of mouth, so if you know people who might enjoy this episode or the artwork podcast as a whole, we would love it if you told them all about it. And if you'd like to financially support this project, you can now do that on Patreon, where you can choose the amount you'd like to give us for lots of fun rewards. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at art.workconversation. And tune in next week for another inspiring episode. Bye. Bye. (laughs) 